Hello, everyone, and, and thank you for joining us today. Um, happy Wednesday to everybody. Uh, we'll be uh, working today here presenting a dry eye webinar uh, by Drs. Campbell Cunningham, Taylor, and Hahn. Uh, we have Dr. Everett with us today, who will be going through uh, all of the information we have for you today. Uh, as a kind of housekeeping issue here, on the right-hand side of your screen, you should see a go-to webinar menu. Uh, on those tabs, you'll see a tab called questions. If you guys have any questions throughout the presentation, feel free to chat your questions into that area there. Um, and then at the end of the presentation, we'll go ahead and have Dr. Everett uh, answer all of your questions and discuss anything in, in further detail that uh, you guys need. Um, you guys are on, on mute through the webinar here, so we won't be able to hear you verbally, but at the end of the presentation, we will be able to cover any questions that you put in that. Uh, questions chat box there. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand this over to Dr. Everett and uh, yeah, good luck, sir. Oh, uh, let's see. I'm trying to get the, uh, there we go. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Dr. Everett. I'm an optometrist with Drs. Campbell, Cunningham, Taylor, and Hahn. Uh, the purpose of today's webinar is to dis discuss dry eye syndrome. I will go over, um, review what dry eye syndrome is, kind of review the different types, go over the uh, components of the tear film, review the symptoms of dry eye, which can range from mild, moderate to severe. Also, I'll discuss the consequences of dry eye syndrome and then discuss the uh, latest available treatment options. Okay, just to start with, dry eye syndrome is simply a condition that occurs when there's not enough tear production or you have sufficient tear production but a poor quality tear film. And why are tears important? Uh, tears help keep the surface of the eye smooth and hydrated. They're also very important for clear vision. If you have a poor quality tear film, you're going to have poor quality vision. They're also important for protecting the eye against irritants and foreign bodies. You'll get this reflexive tearing response. That's your body's attempt to try to flush irritants and foreign bodies um, out of the eye to prevent further damage, and they also provide some degree of protection from infection. Okay, so next, uh, quickly, the components of the tear film. The tear film is made of three layers. The lipid layer, which is the outer layer, the middle aqueous layer, as well as the inner mucin layer. The outer lipid layer is uh, an oily layer secreted by the meibomian glands. And the meibomian glands line the lid margin of the uh, eyelids. And the purpose of this layer is to slow the evaporation of the watery layer of the tear film beneath. It also, this layer helps lower the surface tension of the tear film, keep the tear film stable, and it also helps lubricate the eyelids. Next, we have the middle aqueous layer. This is the watery layer. It is secreted by the lacrimal gland. The purpose of this layer is to supply the oxygen with cor uh, supply the cornea with oxygen. It also helps protect against infection and wash away debris. And it also allows the passage of certain cells uh, to pass through the tear film to reach the cornea and help repair tissue in case of a of an injury such as an, a corneal abrasion. Next, we have the inner mucin layer. Um, <clears throat> this layer is secreted by a special kind of cells of the conjunctiva called goblet cells. The purpose of this layer is to provide lubrication, protect against foreign bodies. It also allows for cells to pass through the tear film, reach the tissue to help repair the, uh, the ocular surface in case of any kind of injury. And it also makes the surface of the tear film hydrophilic, which is water loving. This essentially helps stabilize the tear film. And um, this is particularly important to help stabilize the tear film in between blinks. So next I'll go over the symptoms of dry eye syndrome. Um, common symptoms of dry eye include 
excessive tearing, itching, stinging, redness, light sensitivity, and eye fatigue. And when we talk about dry, we typically divide it into two different categories, uh, evaporative dry eye and aqueous deficient dry eye. These are two separate kinds of dry eye, but a lot of times they will coincide and occur simultaneously with one another. Next, moving on. So evaporative dry, this is basically where you have uh, normal lacrimal gland function, normal tear secretion, but increased tear evaporation. So you're secreting a sufficient amount of tears and you have a sufficient amount of tear film, but your tear film is evaporating too quickly. Um, common causes of this are meibomian gland dysfunction, which is basically just dysfunction of those oil secreting glands that we discussed earlier that uh, secrete the lipid layer. Um, also lid abnormalities, reduced blink rate. This is really common with prolonged computer work. Certain medications such as Accutane can uh, contribute to this as well as vitamin A deficiency. So meibomian gland dysfunction, this is characterized by blepharitis, which is inflammation of the eyelid margins. It's also characterized by meibomitis, which is thickening and inflammation of the oil producing glands. This is commonly associated with atopic dermatitis, psoriasis, and very commonly rosacea. Um, but also keep in mind that this very frequently occurs uh, simultaneously with the other aqueous deficient dry eye. So blepharitis symptoms include itching, burning, tearing, light sensitivity, foreign body sensation, and redness. If you notice here, the patient in this photo is a good example of blepharitis. You can see the eyelid margins here are red and inflamed. There's some debris accumulating along the lid margins, and the eye itself is just really um, red and inflamed, and inflammation leads to discomfort. And when treating dry, the, the goal is to always kind of control the inflammation and then uh, keep the patient comfortable. This is an example of tear film evaporation. The photo on the left shows a healthy, stable tear film. And the photo on the right shows uh, a tear film that is evaporating. And ideally, you would want the tear film to stay stable in between blinks for at least eight seconds. Anything that evaporates quicker than eight seconds is con considered abnormal. Oftentimes with these patients, their tear film will evaporate almost instantaneously when they blink, and this can cause a lot of discomfort. Next, this is just illustrating the meibomian glands. The photo on the left shows healthy meibomian glands secreting a nice healthy oil um, onto the ocular surface where the photo on the right shows thickened and spacated uh, meibomian glands that uh, are you know, oftentimes uh, riddled with some, some level of bacteria as well within these glands. And um, this bacteria can secrete exotoxins onto the ocular surface, which further contribute to inflammation and further contribute to uh, discomfort. Again, this is another photo. Photo on the left is showing healthy gland structure. These, uh, you notice the healthy oil glands on the photo on the right. This is a patient with chronic inflammation, and you can see to where he's this patient has had some meibomian gland atrophy and dropout um, due to chronic untreated blepharitis. So, blepharitis treatment um, it's a chronic condition. Uh, one of the mainstays of treatment is just good lid hygiene. Um, Lid wipes, we uh, frequently use Comfort Clear lid wipes. They work extremely well. And lid sprays such as Zenoptic um, do very, very well. Uh, warm compresses are also helpful. Um, in some cases, we'll need to prescribe an antibiotic or a steroid ointment to apply to the lid margin uh, for usually for a period of about four to six weeks. And also at other times, we'll, we'll, uh, there'll be a need for an oral antibiotic. And this is 
particularly common with conditions like ocular rosacea and doxycycline as an antibiotic that dosed at low levels is a very good anti-inflammatory and works really well for these patients. Okay, so moving on to aqueous deficient dry eye. This type of dry eye is due to la abnormal lacrimal gland function, which leads to decreased tear production. And when we talk about this type of dry eye, uh, we, we break this into categories, non-Sjogren's syndrome related and Sjogren's syndrome related. So Sjogren's syndrome is an auto, uh, autoimmune disease that causes uh, inflammation and destruction of the mucus producing membranes and cells of the body and um, you know oftentimes cause very significant dry eye and dry mouth and other symptoms but all the other types of aqueous deficient dry eye we kind of lump into the non sjogren syndrome related dry eye so let's talk about the first category here the non sjogren syndrome related uh, this is going to be your age-related dry eye. Dry eye tends to worsen with age. Certain systemic diseases can also cause this. Uh, autoimmune conditions, most notably uh, rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, uh, nerve damage, surgery, uh, certain medications, particularly uh, hypertensive medications like beta blockers and diuretics, um, environmental factors such as low humidity, smoking, wind, pollution, allergens, et cetera, prolonged computer work, as mentioned earlier. This also tends to be more common in women, and it's also tends to be a little bit worse. It is associated with menopause, and this is due to changes in androgen and estrogen levels and their effect on the and function of tear production. And also contact lens wear is a, is a major cause, particularly soft contact lens wear, and this can affect patients across all age groups. And Sjogren's syndrome related, again, this is an autoimmune disease that causes inflammation and destruction of the mucous membranes and cells of, of the body, dry eyes, dry mouth, very, very common. These patients oftentimes have significant dry eye syndromes and are, that really affect their quality of life. Um, and this can be further exacerbated by um, other autoimmune conditions that commonly occur alongside Sjogren's syndrome, such as lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. And a lot of times we'll refer to this type of dry eye as keratoconjunctivitis sica. Okay, this here is a photo. This is just showing um, insufficient tear film. If you'll notice the uh, tear lake accumulating at the, uh, the uh, surface of the lower lid margin there is, is really thin and reduced. Um, we see this, uh, anything less than a millimeter is considered abnormal. We'll also see inflammation of the cornea, we call that keratitis. And in more severe cases, we'll see what's called uh, corneal filaments. And this is basically a gelatinous strand of, you know, degenerated cells that uh, are attached to the cornea on one end. And then when the patient blinks, there's another end that just kind of moves freely and causes a significant, uh, you know, pretty severe foreign body sensation. But these can typically be removed uh, pretty easily um, in the office at the slit lamp during your exam. So diagnosing this type of dry, the most important uh, you know, practical ways, just clinical examination, looking at the patient, listen, listening to the patient's symptoms. Um, but we do other, have other tests in our toolbox, such as a Shermer's test, which allows us to actually measure the amount of tear production. We can, of course, order lab tests if we suspect any autoimmune diseases. We can test the tear hyperosmolarity and also corneal topography can be helpful but most of the time we just diagnose dry um, just clinically by observing the patient and kind of listening to their symptoms okay so moving on to treatment options uh, we always start try to start with something over the counter um, artificial tears is a uh, really the first line treatment i've had a lot of success with oasis tears um, and oftentimes for um, 
less severe cases, artificial tears are, are sufficient enough to manage a patient's symptoms. Um, Over-the-counter supplements, um, in particular, I've had a lot of luck with uh, Vitacite O3 Plus McQui. This is a dry eye supplement that you take. It's, uh, it contains omega-3s, um, which help with inflammation and also has a McQui berry extract in it that is uh, very helpful for reducing inflammation and improving the function of the lacrimal gland as well as uh, you know helping stabilize the tear film. Okay so moving on to prescription medications um, some of you may have heard of these uh, very commonly Restasis, Sequa, and Zydra. These prescription medications are aimed at increasing the body's natural tear production. Um, they have some anti-inflammatory properties and they help increase the tear production over time. Typically, these medications take about four to six weeks to work, but they're meant to be taken long term. And most recently, we have Isuvis, which is a topical steroid drop with a very good safety profile compared to some of the other steroid drops that we use. Um, this particular drop is very uh, helpful in cases where patients um, just kind of struggle seasonally with dry eye symptoms. And so we can kind of put these patients on, on this medication for a period of about four to six weeks, get their symptoms under control, and then the rest of the, the year they can, uh, you know, manage their symptoms with over-the-counter um, artificial tears and other supplements. Next, we also have a treatment option on those punctal plugs. This is where we insert a tear duct plug into your tear duct, which is where your tears drain out of the eye. Um, this uh, basically slows the drain, and you have two tear ducts per eye, one on the upper lid and one on the lower lid. About 70% of your tears drain out of your lower tear duct, so by stopping up this tear drain, we essentially keep tears contacting the ocular surface longer and these are easy to insert in office and they can be removed at any time. So moving on to some more uh, treatment options for more severe cases of dry eye. Uh, one great option is scleral lenses. I've had a lot of success with this. This is basically a large diameter hard contact lens that you fill with a preservative free saline solution and uh, then you insert this contact onto the eye along with the saline and it coats the eye and bathes the cornea in a preservative free saline bath essentially um, all day and just keeps it moist and it also uh, provides really good crisp vision as well so this is a very good option for uh, you know patients with severe dry eye where uh, you know other treatment options haven't worked Next, we have amniotic membrane grafts. Uh, the disc you see here in this photo is actually uh, an amniotic membrane graft. This is harvested from the placenta. It, is, it contains uh, many helpful growth factors and, and other things that are very good at controlling inflammation and promote healing. Um, we basically just graft this onto the cornea. It dissolves over a period of about three to four, about three to four days, and then you know, it's it's kind of it's very helpful in getting patients over the hump of, of their initial um, really bad symptoms, and then uh, we can start other therapies such as topical uh, topical prescription drops or or whatever the case as needed. Also, serum tears um, these work really really well. Uh, virtually no side effects with ser serum tears. We actually draw blood draw your own blood and then we centrifuge it out we separate the red blood cells and white blood cells isolate the blood serum which is full of uh, very uh, important growth factors and antibodies and uh, this again this really helps it's very helpful in controlling uh, inflammation and promoting healing as well and lastly for the most severe cases we do have some surgical options available these typically aren't necessary unless there's a, a situation where a patient has, you know, some kind of a nerve damage uh, to where they have decreased corneal sensation, and, and we really reserve this for the, the most severe uh, cases. 
All right, so moving on to why it's important to, dr to treat dry eye. Well, in uh, severe chronic cases, untreated dry eye can lead to scarring, um, as shown in the middle photo um, right here, it can lead to scarring, ulceration, as in the left photo, and also neovascularization, which is this photo over here where you get these blood vessels growing onto the cornea, and all of this can lead to uh, um, vision loss potentially over time. Okay, so this uh, basically concludes uh, my presentation. Um, hopefully you guys were able to learn something about dry eye syndrome today, and um, I appreciate you guys listening. And if any of you out there are suffering from dry eye or feel like you may benefit from dry eye treatment, um, I encourage you to uh, um, contact us and we'd be happy to help in any way we can. Um, we have many locations around the area and hopefully, hopefully we have a, a location that's convenient for you. And um, yep, thanks for listening at this time. I'll turn it back over and um, answer any questions that you guys may have. Great, thank, <clears throat> thank you for that, Dr. Everett. That was awesome. Um, couple, couple of questions we had over here. You know, what are the most common, you know, symptoms, right? Or I guess things that drive people into your office, you know, to seek a treatment for dry eye outside of, you know, over-the-counter options. You know, what, what do you hear most from these patients? treatment options other than over the counter oh no what what are the symptoms that that people you know that uh, we're seeing patients come through that you know have been trying over the counter options but the symptoms that kind of drive them to come in and see a, a professional such as yourself um, to seek additional treatment so what are those symptoms are they are they excessive tearing um, yeah excessive tearing and then also also uh, you know intermittent blurred vision um, particularly this is very common in patients that work on the computer all day long They'll get this intermittent blurred vision. Just their eyes are very uncomfortable and fatigued at the end of the day. Um, also, driving at night, you know, dry eyes can cause symptoms with glare and things like that, and call, and present difficulties driving at night as well. So, is, is that something maybe during the uh, you know the, the COVID pandemic that we're seeing with people maybe more working from home, more screen time kind of thing? You know, are you seeing an increase of the dry eye cases and, and dry eye issues due to that increased? screen time and and you know obviously yeah, the absolutely yeah. yeah absolutely um you know seeing an increase in that and also just the the you know the masks people wearing masks more often you know um, when they exhale the the their breath tends to kind of come up and dry their eyes out so we have a lot of patients um, particularly with blepharitis and evaporative dry eye syndrome, that's really, we've seen a whole lot, of, you know, a very big increase in that um, during this pandemic. Awesome. Now I have another question that just came in here. Um, because of dry eye, how are the contact lenses you discussed different? Well, the contact lenses that I discussed, the scleral lenses, um, they're not a soft contact lens are actually a rigid lens that uh, you fill with saline solution so and then you apply that entire lens with the saline solution onto the cornea so essentially the cornea is being bathed in a nice moist saline solution all day and um, as opposed to a soft contact that you uh, you know you basically soak in a solution overnight and then place it on the eye and it tends to uh, you know, dry out as the day goes on and also tends to, uh, you know, become less comfortable um, as you approach the end of the wearing cycle for whatever particular contact you're wearing. And are those custom fit contact lenses that you guys do at your office? Um, yep, they're, they're custom fit. Uh, you know, we have to take some very precise measurements and then we'll, uh, you know, contact the lab and We'll have a lens designed for the uh, specifically for that patient down to the micron level, and um, it'll be a contact that's specifically for that patient's eye and that patient's eye only. And sometimes, you know, it'll take a couple of follow-up visits, and we'll tweak it until we get the patient comfortably comfortable. But um, oftentimes, they're able to wear these lenses, you know, 16, 18 hours a day, and um, the, the lenses don't really have to be replaced monthly or every two weeks like a lot of the soft contacts. These lenses can 
you know, um, last two or three years or longer. So. And are those contact lenses, what does the insurance coverage look like on those? Um, insurance coverage is usually uh, um, pretty good, particularly if you have uh, vision insurance. It, it tends to uh, be covered, you know, um, as medically necessary. And uh, dry eye syndrome is a condition in which uh, insurance companies consider this to be medically necessary. And then, uh, you know, those would work for, say, patients that maybe were told in the past that they couldn't wear contact lenses due to dry eye uh, syndrome or, or dry eye conditions, those would be a solution for those patients that um, have maybe previously been told that they can't wear contact lenses, but those may be the option for the, those patients. Uh, that is correct. Yeah, it's it's um, it's very good at, you know, a very good treatment option. And sometimes it can be the only, uh, you know, treatment option that really works for, you know, really significant dry eye. But in other cases, if the patient just, you know, wants to wear contacts but can't wear soft contacts because their eyes are uncomfortable, this also um, is a good option for them because it controls their dry eye and then they're able to wear contacts and get out of glasses. And and the optics of these lenses are uh, tend to be a lot better than a soft contact lens. So they actually will have uh, improved vision overall as well. So it's a good option. That's awesome. And then, um, you know, for the patients that are on here looking at, uh, you know, visiting you guys, what, what does it look like when they come in, um, you know, looking to looking to learn more about dry eye solutions? What does that look like in, inside your practice and, and what can that patient expect? Well, you know, when a patient comes in, we obviously, you know, ask them any kind of trouble uh, that they're having. Um, and, you know, dry eye syndrome is extremely common. So, uh, a lot of times patients will have dry eye complaints and, and other things. And, uh, you know, we'll just, you know, be sure to take our time to, you know, address those uh, concerns with uh, each patient and then kind of tailor a treatment plan to that individual patient and what, what would work best for that patient. So would they start with uh, scheduling a general eye exam with you or is there a dry eye evaluation? Um, you know, if they were to call in and say this afternoon and say, hey, <laughs> you know, I want to get rid of these dry eyes. Yeah. What's, What's yeah. my first step there? Uh, either way, uh, you know, um, you can call and schedule a dry eye evaluation and, and you can come in and we can just, you know, evaluate you for dry eye just right out the gate. Or, you know, if you're in for even like a routine or annual comprehensive exam, you know, we'll also evaluate, evaluate you for dry eye at those exams too. So either way will work fine. And then uh, is there any downside to continuous use of over-the-counter solutions such as, you know, clear eyes and, and um, you know, your generic uh, uh, eye drop options that you would see at your local pharmacy or, or grocery there? Uh, are there any drawbacks to that versus, say, a, you know, a more permanent or, or a more, you know, lasting treatment that uh, a patient would get done uh, here at your clinic? Well, yes, there are some drawbacks. As far as, uh, you know, generic artificial tears, a lot of these contain preservatives in them that can irritate the eye over time um, and actually make the eye red and irritated um, over time. But as far as the uh, redness reliever drops, a lot of those, um, particularly some of the, the older older brands and they like your clear eyes and your biazine, those are actually vasoconstrictors, which constrict the blood vessels of the eye. Um, but over time, if you and, and that works well for a while, you know it'll it'll take care of your redness. But then over time, you can become more more dependent on these drops and and need to use you know essentially you'll have to use them you know every day just to keep your eyes from being red. And that's uh you know that's not ideal. As whereas you know a, a good artificial tear like Oasis or some of these other drops like Restasis, these prescription meds, uh, they're they're a lot more healthy for the eye. Yeah, um, especially when used long term. Awesome. Uh, you know, one other thing that uh, you know, I know there's some questions about there is in terms of uh, blue light filtering lenses. You know, I, I know certainly since the the pandemic and the additional screen time that people have been experiencing over the past year and a half. You know, do blue light filtering lenses have any effect on dry eyes, or is that just a general eye health type of solution? <clears throat> well. Uh... They'll, they'll certainly, uh, they reduce glare and can and help the eyes become more comfortable, um, which can, you know, it doesn't really have any true effect on the, the, the root cause of the dry eye. It can help the eyes feel a little bit more comfortable if you're working on a digital um, computer screen all day. 
um, but they are very, you know, very helpful in relieving eye fatigue and eye strain, um, particularly with prolonged computer work. But as far as the dry eye, it may kind of mask some of those symptoms, but the root cause of the dry eye would still, you know, that would still need to be addressed as well. So. Um, and then I think the last question that we have is, you know, really in regards to the timing right now with, with spring and, and, you know, obviously everything in bloom and, and then your allergies start kicking in, you know, out of the solutions you've discussed today, do they have any effectiveness on, you know, spring allergies and, and some of the dry eye things that you have that come along with that? Um, do these help specifically, you know, for people dealing with that situation right now as, as you know, spring allergies are, are coming into full speed here? Well, uh, you know, a lot of times um, dry eye symptoms and, and allergic conjunctivitis or eye allergy symptoms, those, those symptoms can oftentimes overlap with one another. Um, artificial tears are, are obviously, you know, can be helpful for either condition, you know, but, um, you know, at the end of the day, there's still, you know, you have dry eye syndrome and then you have you know, eye allergies and, and the treatment options for those is going to differ depending on exactly what it is. And it can be difficult sometimes to kind of pin down exactly is the patient having issues with allergies or is it dry eye? Um, you know, um, it just, you just got to kind of talk with the patient and, and come up with a good treatment plan. Perfect. And in, in those patients, the best option for them would be just to come in and see you and let yeah, them just, let you know, just come in. And, and, yeah. Yeah, just come in for an evaluation and, uh, you know, just let us know what kind of trouble you're having and we'll uh, talk with you, listen with you, listen to you and uh, sit down and take a look and, and, and see what the best uh, options are for you. Great. Perfect. Well, I think that wraps up the questions that I see. I'll open up the floor. If anybody has any last minute questions, feel free to, to chat those in and and we'll get those through. But, um, you know, other than that, uh, we'll be sending out an email to everybody that attended today here uh, with more information, just the website and, and phone number where you can reach us to, you know, schedule that dry eye evaluation or go into, a, you know, obviously a comprehensive eye exam there to, you know, kill two birds with one stone, if you will. But um, we'll send out that information to you guys. We appreciate everybody attending and, uh, we will be doing more of these webinars as we go throughout 2021, uh, different topics and, and different things to touch on. So we'll make sure to keep you in, in the loop as, as when those are coming out. And we appreciate your attendance and hope everybody has a great rest of your Wednesday. Uh, Dr. Everett, thank you so much for taking the time with us. It was really fantastic. Uh, thank you. You're very welcome. Perfect. Everybody have a great day. Thank you.